to the three-day uh, groundwater show course given by Professor Jacob Bayer, Professor Emeritus of uh, Technia, uh, the, the well-known author of uh, the fluids in uh, dynamics of fluid in porous media, which is uh, uh, being referred to as a Bible in porous media by many people. Very pleased that I have uh, Professor Bayer here. Today is uh, uh, October 13th, uh, Friday, unfortunately. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are at Oxford, Mississippi. So, so we have two parts that uh, we will conduct here, but in two separate rooms. This part, I will invite Professor Bell to give us uh, uh, something like 30 minutes, say uh, his uh, personal view about where to go after we finish a, a very rigorous, very good course of groundwater uh, to talk about something in the future, where to go from here. Then we'll move to another room with a smaller group of people. We will talk a little bit about more of your personal perspectives. So, so Professor Bell. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure that I know exactly what we are going to do now, but I was asked to, to, to say a few words about what I think about the future, and of course not about the future, but of future in this field that we have been discussing for three days now. Uh, I told you already, we have a saying that since the, the temple was destroyed, only the prophecy uh, went to only to uh, stupid people. So, uh, one diff I'll, I'll show you a minute, uh, in a few minutes uh, uh, some presentation that I prepared. But before that I have to say uh, a few words about this field. Sometimes you said groundwater and sometimes we discuss the transport in porous media. Is it the same or, or not? And here I will tell you about my own history. I started, when I started to work many years ago, uh, I came to this field from civil engineering, water resources. I actually started to work as a water resource engineer in planning uh, irrigation systems. And I soon moved to groundwater in this uh, big government company that I was working at that time and uh, since then and I started to work in the field of groundwater and I don't want to, to give the whole history or just uh, jump but a few years later uh, I noticed by looking at actually at the books on my uh, table that I'm not having all on my desk only uh, groundwater books I had uh, books from reservoir engineering, I had books of drainage, I had uh, books from chemical engineering, and they all dealt with actually the same thing, except that they were using different terminologies. But eventually, as we have discussed them for the three days, they all do the same thing because they are using the same Darcy law and they were using the same balance equation and it's actually a much broader subject that just flow in pour, just groundwater. And it made me, made me develop the thinking in the direction of, the general direction of transport, and now you know of what? Of extensive quantity, of all extensive quantity, in that special domain that we defined as a porous medium. And since then I've been working and writing in kind of two directions which are actually the same but looked at from different point of view. The general topic is transport in porous media which, is, uh, which has applications in groundwater, in chemical engineering, in reservoir engineering and recently in a very important area of biomedical engineering because the lungs are porous material with flow and chemistry and kidneys are porous material. With, and, and actually what they're all doing is nothing but if you want a broader subject, continue mechanics. Continuum mechanics at different scales going from micro, molecular scale to micros, microscopic, microscopic and in 78 I, I, I uh, started uh, a journal, International Journal of Transport in Porous Media, which is still going on and I'm the editor of it and we, ha we held the first conferences that brought in people from different disciplines to work in porous media, but 
in addition to all that, each uh, engineer comes to use the uh, theory of porous media in a different application. And my personal application is groundwater, because in the practice I'm working in groundwater. So just to put these two terms, because what I will tell you now is the, uh, what I see as some of the important subjects in the future in these two areas, but mainly uh, in the general uh, transport in porous media, because uh, about uh, three or four weeks ago, uh, actually uh, September 1st, I was uh, given the honor to be the Businesque lecturers of this year in Amsterdam, in a Businesque, uh, Businesque uh, center that they have there. And uh, this year, as you know, uh, Darcy's law is 150 years old. So they asked me, right, uh, give us a lecture about Darcy's law. You, gave, you got the lecture about Darcy's law in, in, a, in a few minutes. And I was thinking about what do I do with lecture of, of uh, one hour. And I started to think from the beginning to the end, what happened during the past 50 years, uh, 150 years, of course I wasn't all the time there, but at least the last 50 years, I was around already in the profession, and why I say uh, last 50 years, because in 1956, there was a conference in Dijon, the city of uh, where uh, uh, Darcy worked, uh, to commemorate 100 years to Darcy's law, and I have on my desk the uh, proceedings of that conference, so I could look what people did then and compare with what people are doing here. And I, I try to see what has developed over this period and looking into the future. So I, what I want to show you is some of the slides that, that uh, I uh, presented during that lecture. We'll go directly to the end. I think it would start somewhere here. So, as I said then, a lot of progress, of course, from Darcy, but the important thing is where do we go from here? So, first I think there will be uh, two, or if you want three, uh, driving forces. One is the need for more and more fresh water. This is the main driving force, and I'm talking now from the groundwater in, in the terminologies that I've been using of transport in porous media and, and uh, groundwater uh, hydrology or management of groundwater resources. Uh, the driving force will be more water and more clean water, and clean water where you have enough, but not clean. This is one of the driving force. This is actually the force that drove this whole subject of solute transport, and uh, mainly and dispersion, and at different scales. Because, uh, as I told you at first, 50 years ago, when people dealt with, started to deal with transport of solutes, they were thinking maybe chlorides for for irrigation purposes or something like that. And we dealt with seawater intrusion, so we had to deal with TDS, but we never told, called it a contaminant or, 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 or a, a pollutant. We said total dissolved solids. It doesn't matter. But over the years, the uh, industry, the agriculture, and the urban development contributed to a severe deterioration in many, many aquifers, also in my uh, country, where groundwater is uh, uh, the main source of water. The aquifer uh, are, have been polluted, and the coastal aquifer, where most of the population has been severely uh, polluted. So this is, will be the driving force. So it will be uh, uh, working to improve our understanding of, of the movement of pollutants 
what I gave you, you can think only about the introduction. Remember, we actually worked at, still at the lab. What we did this morning was still at the lab phase. I called, we, we call it this lab dispersion. When you go into the field, the subject of scales, how to upscale this whole, all these ideas, how do they look in the field and the uh, uh, dominant feature in the field is not because it is large, it is because it is heterogeneous. So a better understanding of the effect of heterogeneity and the scale effect of heterogeneity, how the field becomes more and more heterogeneous as you work with larger fields and the plume that moves from the source of contamination encounters larger and larger heterogeneities as it moves. And therefore you'll see fingering and you see all kinds of things. Another direction would be understanding better or, uh, chemical and biological reactions for two purposes. One is to understand what is going on because we found that in many cases let nature alone do the work. Don't invest so many millions uh, in trying to clean because over the years the uh, phenomena that occur in the subsurface, adsorption, uh, decay, uh, biological decay and things like that tend to attenuate the uh, strength of the plume, the concentration and if you can uh, uh, estimate what will happen, in what direction, physically direction of the movement of the plume, maybe there is only need for good monitoring and be careful but do not invest like in pumping tree. Huge amounts of, of, of money were invested, where uh, investment were forced on communities to clean where really the, it was not uh, uh, necessary. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, one direction to understand better chemistry and chemistry of multiple reactions and chemistry of multiple reactions in, in connection with the solid and biological reactions. A lot of biological activities and, and uh, microorganisms that eat your, your uh, uh, oil spill and things like that, except that sometimes they eat it and, and it's good. Sometimes they, eat, they, they transform it into worse uh, 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 chemicals. So, understanding the chemistry, the uh, biological uh, effects, understanding the effect of scale will be one important direction in connection with the actual management of groundwater. I mentioned here another uh, important uh, area of course and that's the uh, reservoir engineering, production of oil. There is more and more work on how to improve the production of oil, you know that we didn't discuss uh, uh, three phases, but in connection with water I mentioned residual water saturation. There is something like that, of course, in residual oil saturation and when you pump from a reservoir there is a point where a lot of oil still remains but doesn't flow anymore because it breaks down into globules and, and films and it doesn't move anymore and to mobilize it by adding surfactants, by, by steam, by, by, by all kinds of methods uh, uh, is an important area of research because if you could with even 1% increase the efficiency of, of oil production that uh, means a lot of uh, more oil and, and this is important to society. So this would probably be another uh, driving force. I mentioned water, it's not only the water uh, quality, quality that I emphasized, but also the water quantity. I think here we'll see more and more uh, modeling, combined modeling of surface and groundwater, also with respect to pollution because wa surface water uh, on the watershed accumulates sometimes a lot of, of uh, pollutants, bring it, it, bringing it to the uh, subsurface. A better understanding of all kinds of phenomena that occur in the unsaturated zone. I'm not dealing with, with items, I, I'm talking the, uh, in big uh, terms now because I mentioned this morning important research is anisotropy in, in uh, dispersivity, uh, even uh, understanding better anisotropy in, in, uh, in unsaturated permeability. 
We didn't discuss unsaturated. We don't know much about an isotropy in, in uh, unsaturated flow. We, the the, the uh, permeability, the, it's called the effective permeability of, of uh, water in the unsaturated zone can also be uh, un anisotropic but in a very uh, interesting way because then it will depend this we know already I did some work on that uh, it will depend on saturation so it's a kind of an isotropy that let's say the principal directions vary with the saturation so uh, this is an important aspect uh, another area that I think and I'm now moving from groundwater to to transport in porous media another area would be uh, related with biomedical engineering. A lot of work can be done to understand all kinds of uh, performance of organs in the body by modeling their behavior. And uh, the language that we've been talk, uh, using during the last three days is exactly the same language, just change some terms and, and, and maybe uh, say blood instead of water but uh, uh, and tissue being co instead of a solid matrix or whatever but it's the same thing you need the balance equations you need boundary conditions and uh, things like that so this is a direction that i see and the driving forces that will do i i i think i i, I can give you and i left with one or two of you uh, some more uh, details if you want somebody mentioned already the use of tracers uh, the uh, unsaturated zo zone uh, will be important uh, there will be another area of importance and that the management of groundwater resources uh, alone in conjunction with other resources where artificial recharge can play an important role and management of coastal aquifers is a very important thing. So the uh, merging of all the models that we have been talking about as tool for management, but to learn to do them conjunctively, not separately. Today, or the last three days, we discussed only the models. There could be somewhere else a course only on management techniques, optim optimization techniques, linear programming techniques, uh, management under uncertainty, things like that, and now put them together. So that you uh, model and manage the system at the same time, and you optimize whatever you need to optimize. I mentioned already heterogeneity. Let's see some headlines more. Okay, uh, you read it very uh, quickly. Yeah, an important uh, subject uh, mentioned here that comes again and again, and that is uh, effect of climate changes. Uh, there are a lot of research, I know of research in Europe, and I've been involved in, in, uh, in I'm involved right now in a large research projects of uh, groundwater management uh, in Europe, where one of the aspects uh, is uh, to study the effect of uh, climate change, let's say, on on the watershed on one hand, uh, and on um, the coast. Uh, seawater intrusion under uh, rising sea, for example, and Netherlands is very, very uh, worried about that, for example, and some other places too. Uh, so the effect of uh, climate change will also be uh, important and will be uh, researched in the near future. Okay, these are some thoughts, some ideas, and let's discuss them. Maybe uh, you have some additional ideas or whatever. Any question? Um, let me start with, by, by one of the items you have there about <coughs> numerical modeling. Mm -hmm. You did not say uh, elaborate, that uh, of course become more and more powerful, and uh, combined with uh, the tra traditional geologists and the hydrogeologists based on more on the field method, and uh, how to reconcile there. And, uh, and, uh, was, uh, well, I 
First of all, as you know, I am not an expert on numerical methods. That's point number one. I know enough about it to, to participate in discussions, but, but not uh, an expert. But what you mentioned, and that is part of what I called before uh, management. Management requires as input actually two, from two directions, more than two, but I'll mention two. One was the models that we've been discussing. But the models need calibration and immediately that brings the data. So another uh, important subject that uh, uh, requires work, and this is the whole issue of data management. And there's a lot, a lot of data in water resources and in groundwater from geological uh, information, hydrological information, water map, screening for errors, storing it in an efficient way, combining databases directly on the same platform with the numerical codes and, as you know, also combining the numerical codes with the management codes so they all work together. Just the technique, the ideas must come. No, no machine gives you the alternative solutions. Especially no machine gives you the uh, constraint, the non-technical, all the constraints. Because management uh, uh, is driven by two things. What is the objectives that you want to achieve and what are the constraints that limit what you want to achieve. And these are uh, socio-economic, so it's, it brings it to the political arena. It's not a technological one. And this is another uh, subject, if you want, in, in not so much in the work that we are doing here, but if we talk about education of engineers, is more and more engineers should realize that the subjects that they are dealing with, are the technical aspects are the simplest. It's the socio-economic aspects and the political aspects that are important, and their contribution is to bring to the politicians the information in order to make the correct decisions. Correct decisions, in this case, with respect to management of water and, and uh, let's say, water land uh, resources, environmental resources, things that, water quality resources, so that uh, they will know what to expect if they take decision one or decision two uh, and not uh, do it by throwing dice or or by corruption. So uh, these are uh, interesting aspects, but I try to, to stick more to the aspects that we have been dealing with in connection with water resources. Um, could, you, could you explain more on the uh, dependency of scale, with regard, or the impact of scale on heterogeneity and spurgeon? some of the next steps to address those issues? Well, uh, all I, um, I, I could indicate is a direction because we know there's a lot of work. I, I, I didn't do any literature survey for this uh, lecture. I didn't prepare any lecture. But uh, if you open the literature, you'll see more and more in the groundwater literature, stochastic modeling literature, more and more work that uh, First, it starts with the realization, especially in connection with uh, solid transport. And the reason is, I think, pressure propagates very quickly. You cannot have high pressure here and low pressure here a meter apart or, or 10 meters apart. Pressure propagates very quickly. And therefore, the use of averages and Darcy law, also in large scale modeling of flow, was okay. We didn't feel any problem with that. We knew that K varies, we took different K values, but we didn't worry about that. But with concentration, it's different. You may have one concentration here, and 10 meters from there, nothing. You may have a finger. Because the local conditions of the flow and the transport may differ in heterogeneous. And therefore, the scale effect, the scale effect uh, uh, in terms of variability of the properties that affect the spreading of the solute are more and more important and uh, will be investigated in different ways. People do it in different ways. Different. Uh, uh, we've just been working on, on uh, 
uh, reviewing actually, not so much working, but uh, the homogenization method where you can move from one scale to another and uh, each time you smooth further the details, but, but uh, at different scales you may get different answers. So I think this is an important subject. Uh, at this stage, all I want to say is, I feel, if you ask me, it is an important subject. If, it was been, if I solve it, I didn't, and they didn't do much work even in this direction. But I know from my experience in management of water resources in solid transport that this is an important subject. The whole sub, by the way, the whole subject of uncertainty, uncertainty in the modeling of the physics and uncertainty in the management, is very important. So, realizing sources of uncertainty and looking for ways to cope with it, to overcome from the simplest way what we've been doing all the time. I'm not sure if K is 10 or 20. Let's try 10 and let's try 20. And then see how it affects the result, kind of sensitivity with respect to K. And from that, we can learn whether to invest more money in more data to narrow the gap of uncertainty or not. But there are sure better methods to deal with uncertainty such that we put, let's say, statistics into the uh, coefficients and it will result in statistics of the water levels and we bring this statistic to the management and they have to make decisions in the uh, uh, face, facing all these uncertainties so that eventually somebody has to make decisions because you don't pump statistics, you pump so many cubic meters a day. Uh, uh, from your slide, uh, just uh, you mentioned something about uh, oil, or about the oil and the groundwater. So would you about be about oil, 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 and the groundwater. Yes. oil and groundwater. So would you give, uh, give us um, some information about the effect of the oil on the groundwater and also the effect uh, and also the current, <laughs> and the current study about the interaction between the oil and the soil. Uh, and the solid and, the, and also the water. Well, all, all I can say is uh, we missed one day of lecture, well, not we missed, we need one day of more of lectures to deal with multiple phases, to deal with unsaturated and with three phase flow oil, air, and water. Unfortunately, we have many oil spills uh, from leaky tanks from industry, from gas station, a lot of oil, and it goes through the unsaturated zone. Small quantities may volatilize and, and, and perhaps disappear. Also by attenuation, there are certain microbes that, that love to eat oil or gasoline or whatever. But uh, oil dissolves in water. And even although the solubility is very small, that small quantity is enough toxic to render the water, it, is, it goes into the PPB, parts per billion, that makes the water unusable. And, but the dissolved oil becomes a solute, and we've been discussing this flow. So what you solve is a model that you write, a three-phase model with dissolved oil, and, and dissolved oil is one word because you can go to dissolved when you say oil, gasoline, whatever, it's, it's sometimes tens of different chemical species. It's not one species. They may behave similarly, but they have different volatilization rates and other things. So all I have to say is it's important to study how it moves and to develop techniques for cleanup, for remediation. And there are already some techniques, vapor extraction, all that kind of thing. We didn't discuss any of these practical aspects, but maybe you can do, make another short course with remediation technologies, etc., things like that. But it is an important subject. Okay, so I was, what I answered now was looking at, I thought you asked about oil in connection with groundwater. Now, if you, you ask about oil in reservoir engineering, 
there oil is a good thing. In groundwater, it's a bad thing. In, in, and there, we know all about, they, I'm not a reservoir engineer, they know a lot about oil, uh, oil, gas, water movement, because it's always, in most cases, it's a three-phase system. It's very complicated because oil is many components that dissolve in water, that volatilize at different pressure, and, and each component has its own uh, uh, boiling point and volatilization and, and other things. All I'm saying that there is a, a need for research in that direction, uh, of in the direction of how to improve oil production, how to make uh, uh, the quantity remaining in the soil smaller and smaller. And I'm sure, absolutely sure, that there's a lot of research that is being done since the 70s, since the oil, first oil crisis, in that direction. But from the papers that I get to be published in, in the Journal of Transport in Porous Media, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, initially, you were commenting on how um, a lot of your work came from crossing over between disciplines, so he um, and, you know, using formulas from different disciplines and how they all can become interrelated, and I, I think a lot of future advances will come from interdisciplinary work, but <clears throat> the information available to us and the science is growing exponentially. So even from where you started, the amount of information available to you is, is vast. How do you propose to um, cross over between these fields when they're diverging so rapidly? No, I, I, I suggested, my suggestion was actually how to reduce the volume, because instead of, of having five books on the, on the desk, which deal with the same books, just as an example, uh, we deal with the same thing to realize that it's the same underlying theory, if you want, in all these porous media uh, uh, disciplines. Then apply the same thing to reservoir engineering, hydrology, biomedical, chemical. They are all actually the same in, in terms of the porous medium for different purposes. So, by unifying, you make the whole approach to them more efficient. I'm not talking about the fact that people can even move from one discipline to another. And, and we saw it when there was, I think in the 80s, less work in the oil industry. Suddenly we saw many people switching from the oil industry, from reservoir engineering, to deal with, to compete for projects in contaminant transport, because they knew the language, they knew porous medium, they knew transport, etc. So, uh, so this is, uh, makes it uh, unified. And I think that, that uh, the general field of transport in porous media now is very uh, uh, useful and applicable, applicable in, in, in biomedical engineering. It's the same language. It's the same language. From from all aspects, you come to the same, really the same thing. The same momentum balance equation, if you do not, do not uh, uh, delete the, the inertial terms, are for wave propagation, and we need wave propagation. Some research is being done on the use of acoustic waves to move contaminants, to move globules of, of oil. So, they are all interconnected beautifully. I think also there is some beauty in all this uh, uh, science, if you want. And, and, and uh, whenever I see a unifying approach, it's, it's nice. So the truths are universal. The pardon? The truths the truth are universal. Yes. I didn't mention one more uh, uh, aspect in, in hydrology, and that's improvements in uh, inverse problem, in calibration, because we are all the time talking about coefficients, coefficients, but we know very little in the, in the field about these coefficients and how to derive them from, from the data. So inverse problem is also of interest. Let me uh, ask a question that you touched upon about education a little bit. 
that uh, let me kind of maybe really expand on that. That uh, traditionally people do industry grammar are coming from two kinds of field. One field is uh, of course from the uh, geology, uh, geologist background, and the other perhaps from the engineering, civil engineering. So one is uh, more familiar with uh, the natural process of geology, the formation, and the other, they are less trained in that direction, perhaps taught more mathematics or so. So we always need to kind of reconcile those, one side to learn from the other. But even from those uh, people coming from those backgrounds, they are also, as we discussed before, a lot of subjects which are not covered. Uh, let's say undergraduate, perhaps in the in the graduate education, as you mentioned, management, so well, management, very few people would, would, would cover in that area. And other like, say, uh, uncertainty analysis is not a traditional subject. So there are so many subjects that uh, suppose you have the opportunity to define uh, a perfect, say, ideal hydrogeologist. Can you come in what kind of background? That, the solution is in, in a different uh, direction. Uh, first, you are talking, you are saying now, uh, uh, people in groundwater come from two directions, from geology and from engineering. But uh, you know that traditionally, but traditionally, I go 50 years ago, most of groundwater hydrology was geologists, hydrogeologists, not engineers. They didn't calculate anything; they described only. And then engineers came into it. But it's true. It becomes more and more complicated, more and more complex, more multidisciplinary. But only four years of undergraduate. And let's stop with undergraduate. I'm not talk going. So the education must be such that each group, geologists, uh, uh, engineers, uh, uh, geochemists, etc., focuses on one aspect, but should know enough on the other aspects, and you heard these sentences from me when, in, in the book that we are writing, to know enough to communicate with the other groups. Real life projects usually call for many disciplines. And, and uh, uh, I've been involved in many projects, but sometimes you'll see on the same desk in the meetings, you'll see people coming from industrial management because they know optimization, and people coming from the uh, hydrology, the engineers who know the, to build the model and, and, and the uh, numerical computer person, and, and uh, people who come from uh, uh, social sciences because they know the need of society, the constraints in terms of prices and, and, and uh, the importance of uh, uh, water quality and things like that. And they all cooperate. So there must be in the education some general course about, let's say, water resources management, if we stay with water. Water resources management in which people understand what is meant by water resources management. That, that eventually the decision is pump one million. But what will it do to society if you pump or you do not pump? The aspects of water quality, the aspects of if I invest in this, it means I do not invest in something else. So to understand, uh, I must tell you that when I discuss this uh, uh, with students, undergraduate students, and I also told, told them, we talk about water resource management, Engineers do not make decisions. They say, what? I decided to pump 200 in my model, let's say. You don't make a decision. The real decisions in life are always political. You have to provide the politicians with, if you pump A, this will be the consequence. If you pump B, that will be the consequence. And the politician, and the good politician in the sense of the one who represents the people. This is the politician. In what mechanism, democratic, and etc., I'm not going into it. To understand that, that decisions are always societal, not technical. Never technical. The decisions are societal, economic, societal uh, decision. And we provide the information. If you do that, then this will happen. And then translate this, what happened, into economical terms. 
uh, to understand what is management, to understand what is uh, multiple objectives, the idea of weights between objectives. All this you have to teach the engineer, but it, not to teach them how to do it, but about it. On the other hand, those who come from, from industrial management, for example, they lo uh, learn about optimization in multi-objective situations, linear, non-linear, etc. You'll never be able in, in four years and not in 40 years to, to prepare some perfect person that knows everything. So it's up to you. I have only 160 points in four years. What do I teach? What do I teach as a background material, as introductory material, and what I, do I want them to specialize? You cannot specialize in everything. As a follow-up to that, and from the perspective maybe of the student uh, looking at the same question, if, if you had, if you were starting your education now, what say five subjects would you head towards first? <laughs> Which courses? Uh, that's a, a difficult question, but but. Uh, historically, at least myself, I don't think that I heard more than two or three uh, traditional subjects at that time. Uh, I was trained as civil engineer. And in civil engineering, the wet courses were, at that time, remember, quite some years ago, was fluid mechanics, Drainage, drainage, uh, urban drainage of water, uh, and hydraulic structures. I didn't hear anything about groundwater. I did hear Darcy's Law as one lecture in fluid mechanics. Because my, my teacher, for some reason, gave it this subject. Uh, Years afterwards, when I became faculty member, professor, I was involved in, in, in developing curriculum. I taught myself. I developed courses in, in, in groundwater. We developed courses in surface water. We developed courses in management of water resources. We developed courses in water quality, etc., etc. But then, immediately, you could, you could see that no one can take all the courses. So students have to take the electives as strings, not individual electives, as strings. And I tell you more than that, I was dean of, of uh, civil engineering before I retired, the years before I retired, and, and I introduced a new program, not civil engineering. In civil engineering we had three options. Civil engineering structures, phys phys uh, uh, civil engineering infrastructure, which is roads, uh, geotechnical, etc and civil engineering, engineering water resources. Uh, and I added one more program, environmental engineering. Environmental engineering matured over the years because there was a dis big discussion. Is it already a discipline or just an addendum to some other discipline? And I claimed and I succeeded in convincing the Senate that environmental engineering is a subject that, that now has to be a four years program on its own because a civil engineer must learn some concrete and steel, but the environmental engineer must learn more chemistry than steel and concrete. So it, you have to start from the beginning, training. And training is not just courses. Training is to put you in a mood, in a way of thinking, not just the courses. An environmental engineer thinks differently from a civil engineer. Even if they are using somewhere the same Darcy law or something like that. So we developed a program in environmental engineering in which uh, uh, they learn much more chemistry, biology, uh, water quality in terms of water supply, sewage and sewage, sewage treatment, uh, 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 use of water in nature, watersheds, much more environmental engineering, including uh, uh, air pollution, things like that. So again, things mature into a discipline. But uh, environmental engineering can, can, cannot live alone. They are connected to water, they are connected to other things. 
So they have to understand where do they contribute to others and where others are calling upon their expertise. So it's difficult to say I would have done it differently. I did it uh, by, if you ask me today to prepare a, a program, and I say today I'm not sure, which means I, 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 I am sure not, but I will say carefully, I'm not sure that the traditional civil engineer who knows everything, concrete and steel and water and roads and geodesy, etc., is, is a good profession anymore because you know a little about many things. We want you to know more, uh, at least ab in one direction, so you start working in that direction. But a good program gives a good uh, a basic to be able to switch. This is the principles of preparing a good curriculum in academia. But that's not the subject here, the okay. academia. <laughs> okay. We've got time comes around. One more question. Is there any more questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, give Jeff a big hand. Thank you, thank you.